Tonight on Philly Camp Voices, Raheem Manning is with, with us in the virtual studio tonight. Raheem will talk to us about his new position as Nighttime Economy Director. Diamante Ortiz joins us to talk about the work of Reclaim Philadelphia. And we also have two segments, one on a recent protest against the building of an arena in Chinatown and a recap from a recent music festival in Philadelphia. Good evening and thanks for tuning in to Philly Camp Voices. I'm your host, Toya Haynes. <laughs> Being the nighttime economy director, Raheem Manning served as the co-chair of the city's arts and cultural task force for two fiscal years. During his time, Raheem coordinated with the city leadership and legislators to advocate for effective changes that strengthen Philadelphia's nighttime economy. Raheem conducted community-based research with stakeholders to prepare recommendations that supported Philadelphia's arts, culture, and nightlife sectors. Hello, Raheem. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, I'm excited to be here, Toya. Thanks for having me. Yes, you have a really exciting position that's kind of new to major cities. Am I correct? This is yeah. It's, a position. Uh, so it uh, started over in Europe. Uh, first, okay. city of the nightmare was Amsterdam, but so now it's kind of you know taking hold here in the states. And cities are adopting directives of nighttime economy all around. We have one in D.C., New York, um, just on the East Coast, and then I just came on in June, in July. Right. Tell us about what are the duties of a nighttime economy director for those that don't know. Yeah, so my primary responsibility is to be a convener and an advocate for businesses um, that primarily operate after five. Um, you know, making sure that we're bringing and providing a bridge between the city departments and uh, services that these businesses sometimes get missed on because they operate a little later. Um, I'm based in the Department of Commerce, you know, which is, of course, the business branch of the city government. And so we bring resources, support, whether it's financial, uh, whether that's, you know, coaching, advising uh, to, to businesses. Um, but we also, again, make the connection between what residents want their nighttime economy to look like as well, right? So it's not just businesses. People want to sleep at night. People want to, you know, move around at night. People work at night. So advocating to make sure that those people are heard as well. Exactly. I think that a lot of times when we think of nighttime regards to like a major city, we think a lot about arts and entertainment. You yes. know, like, like nightlife. Nightlife is not just arts and entertainment. You know, it's also people that work those night shifts. Can you tell us how um, the arts and entertainment sector, since you were part of that task force before, how that fits into your, your roles as an economy director, nighttime economy director? Yeah. So, again, we know that a lot of the, the, the entertainment and artists, like, make their money at night, right? They're performing, mm -hmm. they're at venues, or even if they're not on tour, you know, they may be doing, like, a dinner and a show. Um, so it's a really big part of that nighttime economy. And so the, the way that this role helps is, is one, be an advocate for them. What do they need, right? So if you're working uh, at an establishment that closes at 2 a.m., well, what do you need to get around, right? Is transportation thought about from your point of view? Are city services thought about from your point of view? Do you have a place to eat after you've been working? Maybe you didn't get a chance to eat because you were entertaining everybody. So when you look at the, the entertainment part of it and the arts part of it, it's advocating and thinking from that point of view. So again, we're making sure that we're not missing businesses and citizens that need services that the city provides um, but sometimes misses the mark a little bit after five because we usually didn't have anybody um, to speak from that point of view. Right, right. Is there anything that you feel is unique to Philadelphia as far as needs? I know you mentioned that this is a newer position in other cities that have already have it, even overseas. What do you feel is unique to Philadelphia that they need right now? Yeah, well, I think uh, the most unique thing to Philadelphia is that we're a city of neighborhoods, right? Uh, so our nightlife and nighttime economy isn't just, you know, directed downtown or anywhere. It happens, you know, all throughout the city. And so bringing that together where we can provide certain services that may be different, right? So downtown needs a different set of services than the corridor like Baltimore Avenue or right. if you're on Germantown Avenue at a, a spot or a restaurant or something. And so making sure that, you know, we're advocating for all of these people to get uh, what they need when it comes to city services and as well as support. You know, I think it's a big thing about uh, with this position is supporting businesses who typically don't have someone in government really thinking about how they're operating, right? Because governments primarily think uh, from a nine to five point of view. And so adding now looking at the 5 p.m. to 9 a.m. and what we can do to better support businesses and help the city thrive, I think is a really big step. And a lot of cities are making it. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. That's really exciting. I love that. What about uh, a big thing that's come up recently about Philadelphia has been safety, particularly at night. And I'm sure that's something that you hear. I wouldn't die almost every day. You know, what are we going to do about, about safety? Um, and I know you, you seem to be so optimistic about this position and what, what's coming, which is wonderful. So with that optimism, <laughs> um, can you tell us like what, what, what the department is working on in terms of helping citizens to understand that you're moving forward in actions that have to do with safety? Yeah, so, you know, the first thing, uh, big thing I did with this position is launch a listening tour so that I was going around speaking to residents and businesses about, you know, what exactly do they need from their nighttime economy director? How can the city better show up for them? And of course, the issue of safety does come up, right? And so I think what we, we can look forward to is that there is now a new voice at the table um, because it's a lot of people in this city that's trying to make sure that we're safe all the time and they're working really, really hard to come up with unique and innovative ways to increase that. However, now I'm bringing a different perspective, right? Because safety looks different during night and day, right? So at night, safety is also about lighting. It's about design. It's about, you know, how are we making sure people are feeling safe, you know, when they're moving through, you know, when, when they don't have natural light to cover them, right? So looking at street corners and making sure that, you know, we're designing in a way that people will feel safe, right? Is it lit up right? Is it bright? Are we following where the activity is at night, right? Because if, if there's a corridor that has a lot of activity at night, we'll need to put some extra things there, right? And so again, safety is a big job and it's everybody's job in the city, right. right? To make sure that we're ensuring that. But from my point of view, I'm bringing those different aspects and I'm looking at it primarily from the nighttime economy point of view, right? Because safety is while people are out being entertained as well, but it's also third shift workers, right? They want to transit and move through the city at night because they're doing services um, that happen while most of us are asleep. So what does that look like as, as well? You mentioned the listening tour. I know that you had the first one at World Cafe Live. That's correct. That's yes. long ago. I saw you had a band, you had people, it was a good like kind of town hall, but also almost, you know, with music and everything. So it was really calm and casual, which I thought was really great. Can you tell us about some of the, can you tell us about the listening tour? First of all, how did that go? Um, mm -hmm. Receiving, you know, that feedback from the citizens and what were some of the concerns that you heard there? Yeah, so the listening tour was uh, great. We launched it off our World Cafe Live. Uh, I am the nighttime economy guy. I come from arts and culture background, so everything we do is going to be a little fun. So, uh, you know, we try to in engage nighttime businesses and, and support them and bring um, exposure as we move through our listening tour, and it's going to be throughout the whole city. Uh, so that was great. Uh, some of the things that and feedback that we got, of course, the safety concerns, right? Talking about that and seeing how are we trying to innovate there from a nighttime economy point of view. But other things are sometimes like um, providing city services, right? Uh, a lot of nighttime businesses are not aware of some of the programs that we have in the city at the Department of Commerce. So being that bridge, that connector, and that convener, right? Um, and it's just because a lot of the programs are being run from people who are primarily working nine to five. But now I can go out and meet these businesses where they are and tell them about the great programs that can help them and help them grow their business and expand. I think the other part, too, is simplifying processes, right? Making it easier to do business from a nighttime point of view in Philly. Um, we have a lot of room to grow there. Um, and this is one of the steps the city is taking to help do that. But sometimes it's very uh, convoluted to understand how to operate and be compliant in a nighttime business because there's so many things are regulating and governing there. So a lot of businesses and citizens are, are talking about that. Like, hey, we, we want to, you know, be compliant. We want to be a great neighbor in our neighborhood, right? We want to respect everybody, but sometimes we don't get that information. Mm -hmm. What are some of those programs that you feel like more businesses need to be more aware of? Yeah, so one of the programs, well, there's a ton, but I'll, go, I'll throw a couple out since we sp spoke about safety. Uh, we have a 50% match program, security camera match program at Commerce. So meaning, if you want to make your corridor and outside of your store a little bit more safe and kind of put a little bit more eyes on there, well, we have a program where we'll cover half of that for you from the city. And so that's like a great program. I think nighttime businesses we're missing out on um, that is very, very effective. We have a storefront improvement program. So if you've been, you know, on a corridor for a while and Maybe, you know, over the years, the, the, the storefront doesn't really look where the neighborhood's going and you don't have the big capital. But we have a program that'll help uh, bring some funds for you to, you know, improve your storefront to make your neighborhood, you know, be vibrant. And so they don't get left behind with a lot of development and things that are going on. Um, other programs, we have an in-store improvement program. So you've been around for a while. It's mom and pop shop. You don't really have that big capital to do a whole overhaul. Well, the city has some match funds for that, some low interest and forgivable loans. Um, which are these, again, are great programs that have been around for a little while, but nighttime economy businesses were getting missed about spreading that information. So, again, we have a ton of other ones. You can find them on the Department of Commerce's website. So I won't go through all of them, but I think those are three that are, are really, really great programs. Wonderful. You know, this is, well, actually, when did you start this position? 
uh, July. July. So you are not even six months left. So within your first year in this position, what are some of the things that you, what's on your wish list of things that you'd really like to accomplish in your first year in this position? So first year is, of course, being a, a, a convener and getting the word out, right? Letting people know that you now have somebody thinking about what your nighttime economy looks like. If right. you are a nighttime business owner, you now have someone thinking about how the city can better, can better support you, right? Because if our nighttime economy does great, everybody wins, right? We bring in more tax revenue. We have a great time. Our city's competitive uh, with other cities where people are looking at where to go and where to stay and where to spend money. Um, so again, getting out there and listening to residents and businesses and then bringing that back and creating a strategic governance plan where we can look at some of the things we can change policy to make it easier to do business here. So if I go around, I'm in West Philly or I'm in Southwest and these businesses are talking about the same things, okay, how can we make a policy change to correct that and to make it easier to do business? So those are that's the main goal for the first year. Um, I have some other programmatic things that I wanna implement that are gonna help address like safety and make our restaurants and uh, nighttime establishments a lot more equipped to deal with the things we we do we uh, experience here today in this country. Um, so that's a, another thing that I want to roll out, but mainly it's just listening and trying to solve problems of our citizens and our businesses. Great. Do you have a date for the next listening? So it's come, I, we're actually going to let out. So we're going to West Philly. We're going to be on Baltimore Ave. Oh. I will officially drop all the dates later in this week, so I don't want to put it out there too much as I'm okay. with the owners. But yes, it's coming up. We're still in West Philly uh, is where we're starting the listening tour at. We're going to Baltimore Avenue next. Great. What can Philadelphia citizens do to help support this initiative, you know, support um, bettering the, our nighttime economy? Like, what do you feel that that we can do in order to support that? that yeah. Effort? yeah, I think be be verbal, right? So I'm here now. And so I, I can't fix and solve and think about everything myself, but I can take what you give me, connect you to different uh, departments in the city to see how we can come up with creative solutions. So at this point, the best thing citizens can do is reach out, you know, attend a stop on the listening tour. They're going to be catered to different subjects um, specifically. So some of them will be about safety. Some of them will be about third shift working and, and, you know, transiting through the city. Some of them will be about, you know, nighttime economy opportunities. Like how do we get more diverse entrepreneurs in nightlife and, um, you know, things of that sort. So I think that's the biggest thing right now. You know, participate, talk, be verbal, share your, your ideas and your thoughts so that I can take those and uh, make some changes that helps the city. That's wonderful. Raheem, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. You guys have a great one. Community reporter Laura Deutsch brings us a segment on a protest that was organized in support of the Save Chinatown Coalition, who are fighting to stop the building of the 76ers Arena and ensure equitable community-driven development in the neighborhood. Save, save Chinatown! Save, save Chinatown! No arena in Chinatown! No The reason that calls me most is the reminder that comes from the Babylonian Talmud. It says in the Babylonian Talmud that if you see injustice in your home, you are obligated to protest it. If you see injustice in your city, you are obligated to protest it. If you see injustice anywhere in the world, you are obligated to protest it. And so to those of you who are coming out of the Jeffrey Breakfast, we want to invite you to stop for a moment and take note. We are here to say no arena in Chinatown. Hi, I'm Deborah Kodish. I was the founder of the Philadelphia Folklore Project, and I was honored to be a co-founder of the Folk Arts Cultural Treasures Charter School. Um, and I'm Jewish. And when we found out that there is a, a breakfast happening here in the Kimmel by the Jewish my... Federation Real Estate Group, where developers David Edelman, Josh Harris, and others are basically selling their idea of an arena in Chinatown at 10th and Market, um, we just had to do something. I have the deepest respect for Asian Americans United. For years, they have fought to stop incursions onto Chinatown. More than 25% of the land has already been taken. And, and this kind of thing is a death knell for communities. Chinatown is the last remaining community of color in Center City, Philadelphia, and it has to stop. And it's just wrong, like for billionaires to be trying to direct the fate and, and erase um, communities of color. So we stand against the predatory development 
against billionaires profiting by building schemes that destroy and displace beloved home places, against putting BIPOC communities at risk and turning, turning valued cultural sites into, yet again, sacrifice zones. We stand for community-centered, community-driven, equitable development. It's a violation of all the Jewish tradition stands for. When there's no attempt to learn about the community in Chinatown, to learn about the needs of its members, to find out the feelings of people in the neighborhood before forging ahead with a plan that could radically alter their living space, is, as this sign says, a shanda. It's shameful. When profits mean more than human beings, that's a violation of everything the Jewish tradition stands for. Our second guest tonight is Diamante Ortiz. Diamante is the communications organizer at Reclaim Philly, an organization that builds the power of multiracial working class in Philadelphia through issue campaigns and elections. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you How are you doing, me. Diamante? I'm doing good. Listen, it is the night before election day. So hey. we have been just, you know, kind of running around, but you know, it's been really great energy and really amazing to see how people have been showing up to the polls and building power in our communities. Can you tell us what's been at stake at this field for this election cycle, um, specifically here in Philadelphia and in the state of Pennsylvania? Yes. So from the conversations that we've had at the doors, Philadelphia's have named protecting abortion rights and reproductive rights, as well as protecting our democracy itself, have been the clear two issues in informing how people want to vote this year. Um, and also recognizing the choices between one party that sees abortion as a constitutionally protected right and another party that wants to ban abortion and other reproductive rights nationwide through the senator seat and also statewide governor and recognizing that the veto power that the governor has um, as well as like with democracy, we know that the choice between the candidates um, who also actively stopped Donald Trump's attempts to overthrow the PA election, as we saw in 2020, and a candidate who also drove busloads of insurrectionists to the Capitol on January 6th. So making sure that folks are not only aware of like what's at stake when we think about, you know, democracy being on the ballot, how does that turn into a ripple effect that also impacts our communities? Mm. What is the work that Reclaim has been doing in response to this election? Yeah, so we have had a fantastic opportunity to really just throw ourselves into our deep canvassing program. Like I mentioned before, we've been able to knock on doors and our uh, deep canvassing program has been designed to have really intentional conversations. And I think, you know, ever since 2020 and even going as far back as 2016, when Reclaim actually started and has been around for the past six years, we have seen the ways in which conversations with our neighbors, with our community members, with our leaders, you know, elders um, and families alike, seeing the ways in which we want to have resources in our communities. We want to make sure that there is safety that is felt, right? And then also making sure that we can, you know, feel a sense of building towards equity and having that responsibility and holding those, you know, who have important decision-making power accountable. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the, uh, the canvassing, canvassing, you mentioned, and yeah. the conversations. What are some of the conversations that you've heard across Philadelphia? What are the yeah. conversations that you've heard? Yeah, the common is really about uh, definitely hearing a lot about reproductive rights and abortion. And I really want to emphasize this as somebody who has been impacted by, you know, the recent uh, SCOTUS decision that happened when Roe v. Wade was striked down and seeing multitudes of people from, you know, the steps of City Hall rallying and protesting and carrying over those conversations have been really instrumental into how we're continuing to fight how we're continuing to mobilize, organize, and really just get folks aware. I think with everything that has happened with Roe v. Wade has really impacted the way in which we're able to really see each other in a more like clear and very distinct way, right? But thinking about how we protect our democracy, as well as um, other things such as minimum wage that should be $15 an hour, immigrant rights, marijuana legalization, and also public school funding. I think public funding to make sure that our infrastructure and, you know, having, um, 
folks like Raheem talking about what is safety that we should be feeling in our communities, how does that go into um, the resources that we need so that way our communities thrive? Wonderful. Regardless of what happens in this election, I know that the work of Reclaim will continue. Can you tell us about where, where the focus is between now and the general election in May? Yeah, thank you for that question. So uh, we don't just organize around like the really big elections. We also believe that national change starts hyper locally. And with that, we want to also uh, invest in our leaders in our base, invest in our members. We have over 700 dues paying members, right? And then we also have multitudes that also come in and do amazing volunteer efforts with us throughout the year. Um, and we also you know, commit to our deep canvassing program and also leadership development. And with the upcoming municipal primaries, um, it's also really important with a city just like Philly that is largely decided the primary um, because we know that Philly has been a majority Democratic city with Democrats outnumbering Republicans eight to one. And people kind of ask as well, because we also haven't really um, heard a lot of conversations or maybe not enough conversations about special elections. How did we get here? Um, so as folks may be aware, four city council members have resigned to run for mayor two months before an important midterm election and it left a lot of vacancies in seats and Democrats all uh, but are guaranteed to win. And most of the time, the Democratic candidates that are trying to run are also handpicked by the Democratic establishment, otherwise known as ward leaders, but sometimes are not aligned with the value of voters. And these candidates can also uphold the status quo and all coming from the same offices or political circles of the council members that resigned. And voters don't really get much of a say in the decision, but in next year's May primary, all council members will be up for re-election. And that's where we can see an actual transformative change in City Hall. So it's really important, um, not only for folks to get aware, but it's also our intention to support the most progressive mayor and the uh, city council member that also aligns with our values in making sure that we have a city that needs to thrive, um, as well as kind of talking before about reproductive rights. It will also potentially carry into next year's election with mm -hmm. some ballot questions. Um, and just also making sure that people are doing the work in their communities and continuing to show up, whether that be through leadership development. Um, we also have trainings, whether that be through coming out to our meetings, starting a neighborhood group as well, talking to your community members and really just like showing up and getting involved. You know, sometimes I think people, going back to what you were saying about being very hyper-local, I think sometimes people don't understand how important these midterm elections are, you know, or yeah. they think, you know, it's just the presidential election, but really it's the, the local level that's so important. Can you just speak to that just a little bit more for those that might not understand and they say, oh, I'll just wait until, you mm. know, can you help them understand locally how this impacts them? Just what would yes. you say? Yeah, no, definitely. I think we have to really emphasize on the impact of what it means to have like a ripple effect, right? With our voting power, we actually carry the decision as a key stakeholder in our communities directly and saying, I don't stand for this, right? I carry my voice, not only from the streets, but to the ballot box, right? The same way that we're able to show up, you know, in participation, in rallies, in demonstrating protests, right? And making sure that we are advocating for the safety that we should be feeling in our communities directly, right? I think it's really important that we're able to, you know, carry that through our elections and not just, you know, necessarily waiting to the last minute. And I think it's also valid in naming like the feelings of disenfranchisement that could come up too, right? Especially, you know, in generations that have might not have felt, you know, in, um, immediate impacts from specific uh, ballot measures or specific legislation or policy. I think it's time that we're opening up a really bigger conversation now and really taking advantage of that when it comes to, you know, what is on the ballot that's really determining our future, our vision, you know, and transforming that into what can be our actual reality and really getting clear on like democracy, you know, fundamental human rights and doing it in a way that is also, you know, creating that need for showing up for each other, right? And organizing and really getting involved and really investing in each other as well. And I think the amazing work that we have been able to do, you know, with our um, canvassing efforts and our deep canvassing uh, efforts is just like not only knocking on thousands of doors in September, but we're also able to train our volunteers to engage in these deep conversations, which involves in relational and also uncovering the shared self. And we also don't say vote blue or red or right or left, but we're focusing on listening to our voters um, or to our neighbors rather, and letting them name what's impacting them and their communities directly. So that way they don't feel siloed and don't feel that they have to isolate themselves um, and also recognizing the political ads that also come about.
about and the ways in which that can bring about a lot of feelings of disenfranchisement too, um, especially think about violence interruption, reproductive rights, um, and just making sure that we dare to imagine what it means to invest back into our communities. Right, yeah. Okay, so thank you so much, Diamante. We appreciate you. Uh, where can we learn more about Reclaim Philadelphia? Absolutely. So we do have a voter resource link tree that I hope will be dropped um, sometime in the chat. But if you want to follow us on Instagram, it is at Reclaim Philadelphia. We also have a ballot guide. We also have multiple ways that you can make a plan to vote. So that way, if you might be that person last minute, it's okay. It happens. Life happens. But we also have resources to make sure that everyone has what they need. Thank you for joining us. Of course. Thank you. Now we'd like to close the show with a recap from Funk Philly, a music festival at FDR Park that showcased arts, culture, and tradi tra traditions of brass and marching bands, produced by Ramses Montes and Nicole Aquino. And welcome to Honk Fest Funk Festival 2022, Yay! yes. Right. We believe that music in the streets helps to reclaim and redefine the use of public space. So we're the Philadelphia Freedom Band, thank you. I really appreciate you all coming. We've got some fantastic food. We have some amazing artist vendors. We've got Maisie in the background with her shadow puppetry. Yay, Maisie. Um, we've got Moonflower uh, baked, baked goods. They're almost sold out, so I definitely suggest going to get it now. And Z's, I mean, you see the line that we have already. So please stay, hang out, the rain will dissipate and we look forward to um, uplifting our artists and celebrating what I love about Philadelphia, which is community and culture. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, yeah, my name is Devon Downs. I'm a muralist, artist, designer, based out of Philly. Um, today we're doing a piece inspired by a band I met. They've been playing in Philly for, I think, over 30 years. I'm going to say Mr. Kelvin is band there, Bob and Barbara's, every Saturday for, I think, a very long time, longer than I've probably been here. Um, but I want to do some Philly natives with the, um, the principle, uh, what is it? We believe that music brings elements of healing power, and I can't remember the other one, but <laughs> uh, all we're doing now is I'm joining everybody or inviting them out to help me do the mural. Um, so we're painting the background on parachute cloth, um, and then we're going to install it on either wood panels so it's removed or on an actual building. Hi, my name is Luis. We are the Rim Bam Boom from Chile. So we're participating this year. It's our first time in Philadelphia. Okay. So okay. it's been amazing, the place, the people from Philadelphia. Oh. Uh, we are glad to be here because they are being so nice all the time with us. Yeah. I'm going to invite all the people here in Philadelphia, in USA, in Boston, New York, with my friend too. In every uh, social media, we are Banda Rim Bam Boom. Or if you want it in English, search uh, like the Rim Bam Boom Band and you're gonna find us, and then you are gonna have everything of, of us. You can hear for free our uh, first album in Spotify. Okay. And you can, you can search it like uh, Ring Bam Boom 2. I'm Regina, I'm a Penn Lions uh, VP external. So um, Penn Lions, um, our general mission is to um, spread, or spread um, I guess like the art of Chinese lion dance to the greater Philadelphia area and you know um, basically share this like wonderful art form with our community and so that's what events like this mean to us. We love to, we love to really share this art form with others and um, celebrate all kinds of different um, you know, culture, all kinds of different cultures and art forms. But you know, this is this is what we and this is what we have to share with others. You can catch the rest of that segment on phillycam.org. Look for Philly Cam Voices. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. You can also watch our show on YouTube and Roku. Make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We'll see you next time. <laughs>